Hello, this is Greg Latta, AA8V, and in the video today, I'd like to talk to you about a device that you may find solves a common problem when you try to take a VFO and drive a crystal-controlled transmitter. As we're going to see, uh, it is inexpensive and it can effectively double the output of your VFO greatly improving the drive on the transmitter or making what was impossible possible. So what is it? It's a tiny transformer like I'm showing here in my left hand. This is an enameled wire version of the transformer and this is a coaxial version of the transformer. Technically it's an onion. It's a 1 to 4 impedance transformer, unbalanced to unbalanced, that is a transmission line transformer. It effectively doubles the output of your VFO, and it costs very little, and it's very easy to make. And in this video, I'm going to talk about how it works, how you can make it, and how you interface it to your transmitter. I think it's very important that amateur radio operators understand fully the technology they use. What I want to show here is how one of these amazing transformers does its job. But to get to it, I want to play a game. Let us start by assuming that we have a source of RF. This could be a signal generator for instance. It could be your VFO. And of course it has a hot lead and a cold lead. We'll ground this lead though we don't have to do that. And I just want to play a game here. I want to start by asking the simple question what happens if I were to take a piece of straight wire and connect it directly across the generator. Now this is a short piece of wire. It's about a foot long. It's very short compared to a wavelength. It's obvious what's going to happen. We are going to get maximum current flow through this wire. We are effectively short circuiting the generator, which is generally not a good idea. But the point is, we're going to get maximum current flow. What would happen if we replace that piece of wire with a piece of coaxial cable, which I'm going to draw like this. Again, this is a short piece of coaxial cable. 12 inches long. That's all. What would happen if I connected the shield of this coax on each end to the generator? Well, now the shield is going to be essentially the wire that we had before and we're going to get maximum current flow. The fact that there's another wire sitting there inside the coax doesn't change the situation we still have maximum current flow. We essentially short circuit the generator. What would happen if instead we connected the center conductor of the coax to our generator? Once again, if we draw the center conductor inside we are going to get maximum current flow. We are essentially short circuiting the generator. And if we even go further and connect both the shield and the center conductor to our generator, we're again going to get maximum current flow. We are essentially short circuiting the generator. 
Now, let's change the situation. Let's go back to our wire. But this time, we make the wire into a coil. And we wind that on a toroid. We could also wind it on a, a rod, but a ferret toroid. So we take a ferret toroid. As we're going to see, it can't be a powdered iron toroid. It has to be a ferret toroid. And we wind our wire around this toroid. Now, what happens? If we have enough windings, and if the permeability, the magnetic property of this toroid is high enough, we find that very little current flows through the circuit. Pretty much exactly the opposite of what we had before. The toroid coil is functioning as an RF choke. An RF choke is an inductor whose inductance is high enough that it completely or almost completely impedes the flow of any radio frequency energy through it. Now let's take a look at what's going on. Why does that happen? When you run any kind of a current through a coil, whether it's direct current or alternating current, a magnetic field forms around the wire. If that magnetic field is changing, and it certainly is if we're running alternating current, and if we're running radio frequency alternating current, it's changing very rapidly. Maxwell's equations, which govern, which govern all of electrodynamics, state that when you have a changing magnetic field, it produces an electric field. And in this case, the changing magnetic field about the wire, which is quite strong because of the number of turns and the magnetic material inside, induces a counter EMF in the wire that at all times opposes the alternating EMF that we're putting on the outside. This is called reactance. And if the counter EMF is almost as big as the applied EMF, very little current flows. It is the inductance of this which chokes off the radio frequency current. And this is true even if we change the situation. Suppose we change the situation where we take the toroid, and I'm not a very good artist, but here's our coaxial cable again. I'm just going to draw the ends of the coaxial cable. And we take our coaxial cable, and we again wind the coaxial cable around the toroid like that. I'm not going to draw a big fat coaxial cable. We've got a fine coaxial cable that we wind around this. We play the game again. If I connect the inner conductor to the generator, very little current flows now. The presence of the shield doesn't change what's going on here. The presence of the shield, just having the shield there, doesn't change the fact that the inner conductor now acts like an RF choke. Very little current flows. Likewise, if I make the connection instead to the shield, very little current flows in the shield. The shield behaves like a wire. It behaves like a wire that's wound on an inductive core. It behaves like an RF choke and very little current 
flows. We can even put these in parallel, connect them both at the same time. And now the coax behaves like a big heavy wire. And once again, very little current flows because it acts like an RF choke, not acts like it is an RF choke. Provided we have enough turns and we have a high enough permeability in the material that it's wound on. All right, now let's change the rules of the game. Suppose instead of doing it like this, Let's connect the coax up like we normally would. Let's bring our coax out up to here. And now I'm going to connect a load across the coaxial cable. And down here I'm going to connect the coax Let's see if we can do this right, so that we connect the ground to ground and we connect the center like that. In other words, we hook the coaxial cable up to our generator. This could be a transmitter now. And we run the RF through the cable and hook it up to a load. Now based on what we just said, each of the conductors in the coax, the shield, acts like an RF choke. The interconductor acts like an RF choke. So by the same logic, we shouldn't be able to get anything to go into the load. Yet if you do this, you discover, of course, that the energy does get to the load. If this happens to be your antenna and this happens to be your transmitter, winding some of your coax around a toroid doesn't change the situation. All right, that's actually called a common mode choke. It doesn't change it. So how the heck can the energy get through if each of the conductors in the coax, the shield and the inner conductor, are both acting like RF chokes? What is different about this situation. Careful inspection shows that in this case we are using the coax not as a wire but as a transmission line and that in all cases the current at any point instant in time comes out to the load and goes back through the other conductor that the two conductors of the coax are carrying at all times equal and opposite currents. They each produce magnetic fields, but because they're equal and opposite, the two magnetic fields, and the electric fields for that matter, cancel out. When the coax is used as a transmission line, there is no external field produced. Therefore, there is no changing magnetic field to penetrate into the magnetic material. There is no effective inductance caused by the presence of the toroid, and there's no opposing EMF. There's no reactance. As long as the currents are balanced, and as long as this is functioning, therefore, as a transmission line, the presence of the toroid does nothing to impede the flow of current. This is a very important concept in understanding how this kind of a device works. As long as the currents are balanced and doing this in the coax, in the outside and the inside, there's no impedance. But if we have just one conductor carrying the alternating current, then it functions as an RF choke. All right, we're almost there. Now that we have that, let's continue to play thought games. 
let us take our source let us hook to this some coaxial cable once again this coaxial cable is very short it's only about 12 inches long okay so it's very short coaxial cable. Here's our inner conductor. And we connect this coaxial cable to our generator, like we would normally do it. We can even ground this again if we want. And just to put some numbers in here, let us suppose that our generator produces about 5 volts peak to peak in the coax. That's typical for an amateur VFO. An HG10 Heathkit VFO produces about 5 volts peak to peak. My solid state VFO, uh, my direct digital synthesis VFO produces about the same. So we have 5 volts peak to peak here. And of course this travels through and so we also have 5 volts peak to peak here. And furthermore, this is in phase because this coax is so short, we're at high frequencies here, no more than 30 megahertz. This coax is so short uh, compared to a wavelength that the time to travel out and back, travel the 12 inches, is insignificant for the case that we're considering. So this is in phase, all right? So we have five volts peak to peak here, and we have five volts peak to peak here between the center and the outside shield. Well, if I have two alternating current sources, this one and now this one, and they're in phase, why can't I connect them in series. If I connect the shield of this one to the hot lead of this one and then come out to here compared to here, why don't I get 10 volts peak to peak here? After all, this is 5 volts, this is 5 volts. I have the um, have them connected so, so that they are correctly connected relative to phase. Why don't I get 10 volts peak to peak here? Now, if you do this, it doesn't work. Boy, I wish it would. It doesn't work. Because when you make this connection right here, you are using the shield. Remember, the shield is the whole thing. The shield short circuits the AC generator. The moment you connect this, the current flows back this way through the shield. It flows back through the shield, and it short circuits the generator, and it doesn't work. Rats. But this is the cool part. What if, instead of doing it this way, you wrap the coaxial cable around a toroid? And now, we do this the same way. I've got to redraw it here. So here's our coax going around the toroid. I'm not going to make it fat. I'm going to blow it up here so it comes out. And there's our shield. And here's the other one here. And it comes up. Okay. So this is really, you know, the coax. And uh, once again, we hook this one. to our generator and we again have at this point 5 volts peak to peak. 
Now, what happens if we connect this shield to the center conductor of this, which I admit when you first look at it seems to be ridiculous. You're short-circuiting the generator, so we're short-circuiting the generator. But, but wait! If that current tries to flow back through the toroid along the shield, it can't do that because of the choking effect of the coax. The coax has this going on, and on top of that, there's now a current trying to go by itself along the shield. It can't do it. And what happens is, holy cow, it works. It works. What we get here is if we bring this out compared to ground, we do in fact get 10 volts peak to peak. If we can choke off that current that tries to travel unbalanced through the toroid, it can't go through because of the choking action. And over here, we get twice the voltage that we put in. So that if you have a VFO that puts out 5 volts peak to peak, and we make this device, you can have 10 volts peak to peak coming out. Now when you double the voltage, that means that the impedances at the output and the input uh, differ by a ratio of the square of the voltage change, which is 2 squared or 4. So you have 4 times the impedance here that you have here. This is the basis for onions and balance. It is possible to arrange this so that neither side is grounded and then it's a 1 to 4 balance. But this is a 1 to 4 onion. This is a 1 to 4 un un. And it's very easy to make. All you need is a tiny core, like you see here, made out of coax or enameled wire. Here is what's fascinating. This does not have to be coaxial cable. This can be parallel open wire line. And you say, Greg, that can't possibly be. I can't take four inch open wire line and wrap it around a toroid, unless the toroid were this big. Well, you don't have to have huge open wire line. You can take regular enameled wire like this and run it next to itself and you have open wire parallel line that's spaced about a twentieth of an inch. And yes, you can wrap that on a toroid like that. There's one made out of enameled wire and here's one made out of coax and either way it will work. In fact you can see in this one how I have connected them together. So let's go and take a look at eventually how do we make one. But the burning question is what do the magnetic properties of this core material have to be. You might find some cores at a ham fest, or you might find them online at a bargain rate. How do you know if the core has enough permeability for this to work? If there isn't enough inductance for it to function as an RF choke, this current won't be choked off and you won't get the 2 to 1 ratio. So the question is, how do I know what core to buy, or at least if a particular toroid core that I have will work in this situation. Let's go take a look at that. To make one of these, it only takes two things, the wire and the ferret core. Let's talk about the wire first. You could use coaxial cable, as I've been doing here. The trouble is, the only coaxial cable that I know of that's readily available 
It's RG174 and it's really not that easy to buy. Also, it's kind of thick and that limits how many turns of wire you can put on a given core. Better is what we call enameled wire or magnet wire. This is readily available uh, various places including Amadon Associates who also carry the cores uh, carries the wire and they carry a variety of cores as well in particular one that I know does work. As far as the size of the wire if it's too thick it's hard to deal with and you can't get enough turns on the core. If it's too thin uh, it's hard to solder, it's hard to strip and it's hard to work with. So an optimum size is about number 24. This is number 23. Remember the bigger the number with wire the smaller it is. So anything from like 24, uh, maybe 26, 23, uh, whatever you have as long as it's not too thick or too thin. One place to get magnet wire if you don't have it is to find uh, a burned out transformer. You might be able to take that apart and get some, some uh, good wire off of that. An old motor might have some uh, magnet wire. This is also called motor wire. Uh, old television yokes, if you've got a really old television set, a CRT set with magnetic deflection, the yoke can be unwound for the wire or you can buy this. It's readily available online. It's either called enameled wire or magnet wire. The core is a different matter. The core has to have a high enough permeability that the choking action will take place. And it is possible to easily measure the property of the core if you have a way of measuring inductance. And the easiest way to do that is an SWR analyzer or an antenna analyzer. I have an MFJ antenna analyzer, and as you're going to see, it's perfect. The way I determined the inductance that you need was based on this particular inductor. I had a situation where I wanted to take my digital VFO and drive my ICO 720 transmitter. When I hooked it up, I found that it would work but barely. It really didn't work the way it should. And that's because the VFO had 5 volts output and the manual said you should have 10 volts peak to peak output. So I knew that I was about 6 decibels too weak. Well I'd read about these but you always read about them in the antenna section of the ARRL manual. Also I had a book, this one, that I had studied, which is all about these transmission line transformers. It's still in print. If you know, want to know every single thing there is about these, get this book and check it out. I knew that these transformers could easily double the voltage and that's exactly what I needed. It also turned out that I had bought a grab bag full of toroids at a ham fest. And when I separated them all out, as you can see here, I had a huge selection of these toroids. And if you look at the bottom, in the bin near the middle, you'll see a whole bin full of these. These are coaxial cable wrapped around a core. I didn't know if it would work. So I wired it up, tried it, and it worked beautifully. So knowing that, and I've used these now in two or three different places, so I know it works, I took this, and as you can see, I hooked it up to my antenna analyzer, set the analyzer for reading inductance, set the frequency to 3.5 MHz when you use an antenna analyzer, you usually have to specify the frequency. So since this is going to be used at either uh, 3.5 or 7 MHz, I set the analyzer for 3.5 MHz, clipped it to the inner conductor on each side, and measured the inductance. And as you can see, it reads about 3.8 uh, microhenries, and call that 4, so I knew that if I had a core 
that when I wound seven turns of wire on it, gave me about four microhenries or more, I knew it would work. And so, I went around trying different cores that I had in the shop. Uh, you can see this red one. This red one is a powdered iron toroid. It comes from a set that I have. I know the specific values of that toroid, and I knew it wouldn't work. But I measured it anyway. I wrapped seven turns of wire around it. And when you wrap the wire in it, the first time it goes through into the little rabbit hole, as I call it, that is the first turn. So you go in. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hooked it up, and you can see that the inductance is only about 0.38 microhenries. That's 10 times too low. That, that's, that's way too low. I grabbed another one out of a junk drawer that I had. And this was a green one. As you can see, when I hooked it up, after winding seven turns on it, I found that it gave one and a half microhenries. Now, I don't know if that'll work or not. I know that four works. One and a half might work. I'm not sure. But with four, you know it's going to work. Then I grabbed another one. I had a whole bunch of triple stacked toroids that had windings on them. I unstacked them and then tried putting one, a core, two cores, and three cores together. Here you see two of the cores stacked up, and that gives uh, 7.3 microhenries. That would definitely work. And then you see that three of them gives 13.7 microhenries. All of these with seven turns. That means all of those would work. The, the thing you can learn there is that you can stack cores. So if you have a core that gives you a reading of two microhenries, and you have two of them, stack it up, put seven turns around it, and see if you get four. Hey, use that together. You can hot melt glue them together and use that as a single core. You can even stack three of them if you want. As long as you get four microhenries with seven turns or more, then it is going to work. Now, I had a small toroid, and that is the one that I used to wind this one. This is a toroid, and I'm showing it here now, after it's been wound. And I measured this one with seven turns, and it was about uh, three or four microhenries. And after it has been wound, because I now have 11 turns on it, you can see that I have even more. Here, it's like 9 or 10 microhenries. So that definitely will work. This is an FT-50A-61 core. The FT means ferret toroid. The 50 means a half an inch. The A means it has a bigger hole in it than some of the other ones, and the 61 means it's type 61 magnetic material. It has a uh, core number of what is called AL75. AL75 can be put into a equation to calculate the inductance, and it's safe to say that if a core has an AL value of 75 or higher, it also will probably work. Now, these things are so easy to make that if you don't have any measuring equipment, don't worry about it. If you have a toroid on hand and you've got some wire, make the transformer and try it and see if it works. If it doesn't work, you've lost a little bit of time and maybe a little bit of wire. But it's so easy to make, you can try it and see if it works. So the key thing is, if you wind seven turns on it and you get at least four microhenries, that core will probably work. And as far as the wire, 
magnet wire or enameled wire that is near a number 24, a little bit on either side, will probably work fine. The next thing we need to do here is talk about how do you actually wind it. To wind the toroid, what you need to do is get your wire ready. You're going to need two identical pieces of magnet wire. If you don't care about wasting a little bit of wire, you can make it longer than necessary. But if it's way too long, it's hard to thread it through. So what you might want to do is practice threading it with one piece of wire to determine how long it should be. You want leads that are about two inches long going in and going out and then you have to have enough wire to do the required number of turns. How many turns? Depends on the toroid. You need to have at least seven turns so that you get that four microhenries but more is better. Turns out on this particular one which you can see here where I'm just getting ready to start winding it it turned out that I could fit comfortably 11 turns, by filer turns they are called, on the toroid. You put the long part of the wire through and that counts as turn number one. Again, it's not important in this particular case because the actual inductance is not important as long as it's big enough. But if you're making a toroid for a particular inductance, it's important to count the turns correctly. First time it goes down through the rabbit hole, that's turn number one. So you put the wires down through the hole until you've got maybe two inches of lead length left. The wire must be close together and parallel at all times. It can't be twisted. It shouldn't cross over itself. It should be parallel at all times. Press it down. Wrap it around. As you can see here in the photo, here is the the first turn and then bend it sharply around the core bend it sharply around the top and then feed it through again for the next turn pull it tight so that it's crisply sharp around each of the edges of the toroid and continue to do this here you can see how it looks after three turns continue Spreading it out, you can get an idea after you've done this, and it's perfectly okay to mess it up and pull the wire off and start again. You're best off if you start again using new wire, but you can reuse the wire if you want. Spread the wire out because eventually you want those turns of wire, how many you have, equally spaced out around the toroid. Uh, here you can see it after six turns. And then finally on this particular one, we see it when we finally have a total of 11 turns on it. You can see how the wire is spaced out nicely and parallel. Remember, this is a transmission line. This is open wire line, though closely spaced. So you want it touching itself as it goes around, but you want those bifilar turns spread out. You can cut all the leads to the same length. And then you have to strip them and tin them. Now, people deal with enameled wire different ways. I've been doing this for years. And the method that I've been using for years is to use a cigarette lighter. Even better is a cigar lighter. Cigar lighter has a hotter flame. And you burn the end of the wire. So you just burn the little end of the wire there. You'll see the the enamel burn off and flare up. Do that to each of them. Don't burn too much though. And then here you can see we burned it. Then take some fine sandpaper and carefully sand the ash off the end of the wire. You can scrape it with a pocket knife too but I found that the sandpaper works very well. You can't just sand it one way. You have to sand it like this and then move it a little bit and then rotate it a little bit 
and rotate a little bit so that you get all sides of the wire sanded and you'll be able to see bright copper when you have the ash removed. Here is a picture where you can see that the leads have been uh, sanded now. After that, after that, you tin the wires. Use your soldering iron, heat the wire, make sure the wire is hot, touch the solder to the wire, not to the iron, so that the solder coats the end and you have nicely tinned leads as you can see here. The last thing you do is to connect the correct two wires together. And this is where some mistakes are made. Remember what you want to do. If you did it with coax, what you're going to do is after the coax has gone through and been wound around, you want to connect the center lead of the coax bit that's come through, okay, that's going to be your output. And the shield from that coax that has been wound through is going to be connected to the inner, connect, uh, inner uh, conductor of the part where the coax goes in. So as you see here, after you've gone through, you want to connect the coax shield to the inner conductor where it goes in. Well, in this case, what is going to happen is you don't have that. You don't have a shield and you don't have a center conductor. You just have two wires. So what I do is label the wires. They're going in here and one of these can be labeled A and the other can be labeled B. And that's going in. And this is A and then B. Then they're going to be coming out. How do you know which one is A and B? Well, if you look at my pictures very carefully, you can figure that out. But one surefire way is to use an ohmmeter. If you take an ohmmeter and connect it to A or a continuity tester, you can touch it to each of these and you can verify which one is A. Okay, you can verify which one of those is A and which of those is B. Okay, and so A comes out and so you can see here, A is my shield. A, usually if you, if you wind it this way and you don't cross the wires, when you come right off, this is on the top and this is coming across the bottom now, usually this one is A. So you test for continuity to locate A and then this one is obviously B. It doesn't make any difference which one of these wires you call A. It, it doesn't make any difference, but I use the bottom one. Then what you do is you connect in the middle. You connect A and B together. So you connect these together twist them together and solder. This is A and this is B. And your transformer is done. The input is here. This is your input and this is ground. And this is your input and this is your output between here and ground. So your signal goes in here and the signal comes in twice as, comes out twice as large there. If you have an oscilloscope, because an oscilloscope can measure small voltages, you can hook a signal generator to here and measure the voltage coming out of the generator and then connect it here and verify that you're getting twice uh, the voltage coming out 
that you have coming in. The next thing we'll take a look at is how do you use this to connect your VFO to your transmitter. Now that we're done building the transformer, let's go over again how we make connections to it. As I've shown here, there are four leads coming out of the transformer, two of which have been connected and soldered together. The bottom lead is your ground. The two leads connected together, that is your input. So your input from your VFO is connected between these two leads and ground. And the output from the transformer is between this unconnected lead and ground. You will notice that I've added something here. I've added a 0.01 microfarad capacitor in series with the output lead. There's a good reason for that. Connecting the transformer to the VFO input or to the crystal socket of many transmitters will effectively short circuit the grid to ground. It'll short circuit the grid resistor and remove the grid bias from the tube. We don't want to do that. By putting a capacitor in series, we prevent that from happening. So I recommend, in all cases, because it's so easy to do, putting a capacitor in series with the output lead. The other thing that I don't recommend, but I say you have to do, the transformer must be mounted at the transmitter. You can't have it in your VFO and then have a piece of coax going to the transmitter. The, tra uh, the transformer must be mounted on the transmitter. The coaxial cable comes from your VFO to the input of the transformer and then a very short length of coax or wires, four inches or, or less, connects the transformer to the transmitter. Okay? Now that poses a little bit of a problem and I'm going to show you how I was able to do that with my ICO 720. I got on this whole project because I have an ICO 720 which I love to use and uh, I wanted to increase the drive on the transmitter. This is the crystal oscillator in the ICO 720. Uh, and you can see here the problem I just mentioned that the VFO input goes directly to the grid of the tube and connecting this to the VFO input will short circuit the grid resistor and remove the grid bias from the tube. So be sure to use that capacitor. Now, where are you going to put this transformer? As you can see here, I put it in a pill bottle. On the top of the pill bottle, I mounted an RCA jack. I took a short piece of coax, RG58 or RG174, as I used here. I put an RCA plug on the end. That will go into the VFO input jack on the back of the transmitter. And I run it inside the pill bottle and I wire all of the components, the 0.01 capacitor and the other components are mounted onto the RCA jack that is in the top of the pill bottle. Then the entire thing is put inside the pill bottle and it looks like this. You've got a pigtail coming out, very short, about four inches. That plugs into the VFO input on the radio, and the VFO plugs into the RCA jack on top of the pill bottle. Couldn't be easier. If you've got a nicer enclosure to use, by all means, do it. But I just let it hang there on the back of the transmitter. You can't even see it. Now, what if your transmitter doesn't have a separate VFO input. Then what do you do? Well, in that case, you use the crystal socket. Now, there are many, many different types of crystal oscillators out there, but the one that we see here in the ICO is very common. It has these two feedback capacitors. It's got an RF choke here to 
uh, the uh, cathode of the tube. This is a common feature in many of them. And if you look at the crystal socket, usually one side of the crystal socket is connected to ground, but not always. Sometimes there's some other stuff. But in almost all cases, the other side of the crystal socket somehow makes it to the grid of the oscillator too. This resistor might be up here. It just depends. But one side of the crystal socket is going to somehow make it to the grid of the oscillator tube. That is where this lead goes. You go through the 0.01 microfarad capacitor and the output of the transformer goes to this side of the crystal socket. In fact, what we can do is we can take this out now and this is what many of them look like, like that. Except for this business over here, which is very important and I'm going to talk about it. So the output of the transformer goes to the crystal socket side that makes its way to the grid of the tube. As I say, there might be a resistor in here, but that's the side you want. If the other side of the crystal socket is grounded, fine, connect the ground lead to that. If the crystal socket, if the other terminal in the crystal socket is not grounded, then connect this somehow to ground. Close by. You can't have long leads and so forth. So this is connected to ground either at the crystal socket or some other convenient point. This one is connected to the other crystal socket pin that goes to the grid. Now that's how you make the connection. Fortunately, if you do that, you probably won't get full drive on the tube. The signal doesn't go to the grid of the tube. That's a common misconception. When you put a signal into a tube, it has to go between two of the tube elements. In this case, it has to be applied between the grid and the cathode. The trouble with this circuit is that if we connect one lead to ground, the cathode is not grounded. The cathode is connected through an RF choke, and it's also connected through a capacitor here. Neither one of those allows RF to get through it very easily. If we're putting our signal in here and trying to get it over to here, these things are getting in the way. We need to get around them. ICO did that. ICO put in a switch on the back of their transmitter. And what does that switch do? When you switch it to VFO, it connects a, point, a 0 0.002 microfarad capacitor between the cathode of the tube and ground. When this is switched over, it puts a 0 0.002 microfarad capacitor from the cathode of the tube to ground. So there is a good chance that you will have to somehow add that capacitor. Now don't cut out any parts. It's easy enough just to, to, to wrap it around here, hook it onto the tube pin. You can put it through a switch if you want, but if you don't put this capacitor in, you might not get full drive on the oscillator tube. You're trying to feed the signal in instead through this 220 picofarad. Notice that this, which is uh, two, uh, 2,000 picofarads, and this is 220 picofarads, this is like, like uh, uh, 10 times the capacitance of that one, making it 10 times easier for the signal to come in, go to ground, and then get to the cathode. It might work without it, but I suggest you try putting it in. And then you got to remember that you put it in. You got to remember that because if you then try to use a crystal, it won't it won't work with the crystal. So if you can use a switch here, that that's great. If it works without this, by all means, that's fine. But if you need a little more drive, try putting this in. It might work better, but make a note in your manual or something that you added it to the circuit 
so that if you ever sell that radio or something, the person that gets that radio knows that you made that change. Keep a record so that other people know. That's pretty much it. The signal comes from your VFO, goes into the transformer, gets doubled in voltage, that's six decibels more, comes out, goes into the crystal socket, and gets amplified, and there you are. I urge you to go look at greglatta.com and check out the many things I have there. One thing in particular is I have a section on building a direct digital synthesized VFO. It was from an article in the 2014 uh, issue of QST magazine. Everything you need there to build that VFO is included. Also, how to key the VFO and so on and so forth. Once you use a digital VFO with a classic rig, you never want to use crystals again. I use the same setup with my uh, Viking Ranger. Even though I have restored the Ranger, the VFO is not as stable as a modern digital VFO. I run the signal into the Ranger transmitter the same way. In fact, what I do is I have a special plug that I have made that goes with the Ranger and plugs into the crystal socket. It contains the transformer and the capacitor in there. And you'll see this mentioned on my website concerning the Viking Ranger. And I plug the VFO right into the front of the Viking Ranger. I hope this video has helped you figure out how you can improve the drive on your a transmitter and perhaps now you can use that VFO with transmitters you couldn't use it with before. Take care and thanks for watching.